I turned 40 a while ago and uh, I had kind of a fantastic midlife crisis of not really knowing what, I, what the hell I was doing oh, do, with do my tell, life. Do tell, do tell. How'd you, how'd you realize uh, it? <laughs> um, well, I was freshly divorced and there was a pandemic. And I was like, mm. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I don't know how to make choices in my life. I don't, you know, I was depressed. I was sad. I was confused. Everything kind of sucked. And so I started a podcast about the meaning of life. But my goal mm -hmm. is to not be forgotten in the first two generations. Which is weird. I, I don't know. That was it. That was my whole thing. Because at the end of the day, like, like I don't know about you, but like, for instance, when my father died, everything he worked for just went. It's gone. He didn't mm -hmm. take it with him. Mm -hmm. I said, what would happen if he died? Right? And my mom has had a stroke since I was two, so she was, you know, she was nowhere to take care of the family. The business relied heavily on him. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Evolution Podcast today. All right, let's go ahead and get that, get that tune in. All right, we've got, we've got an exciting guest for you today. Okay, and this we're going to be talking about money. Talking about some funding, all right, and I've got the right guy for you. So he's gonna be joining us here talking about. Let's go ahead and pause the music, guys. Let's go ahead and pause the music. We're gonna be talking about venture capital, okay? If you're a business owner, you just got started in business, and you're looking for a way in which you can actually get funding, because a lot of people don't know this that only 0.05 percent of actual startups actually get VC funding, okay? So I'm gonna have my man here. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Hello, I'm Haya. I am Hiya. a uh, human living in Oakland, California. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Round of applause. Round of applause for Haya, please. Round of applause. Woo! I love it. I love it. All right, Haya. All right, Haya. Now, uh, I want to just, I want to ask you a few questions. How'd you get started in, uh, in the VC world? It's kind of a weird story, but basically, um, I always have this opinion that, you know, anybody who goes into VC and shares their story, it's like breaking into Fort, Fort Knox, right? If, you, okay. if you're able to get in, they'll completely prevent you from getting in that way ever again. So it's, uh, it's, um, this, there's as many journeys into VC as there are people in VC. But my particular journey was that I um, was working on a startup and uh, doing a lot of work with um, Crunchbase. And via okay. somebody at Crunchbase, they were like, wait, what are you doing? It seems like you're doing all these very strange searches on this on this website, on this uh, database of, of investments. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm actually doing two things. One, I'm a journalist for TechCrunch, which means I'm writing about a lot of startups. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to raise money for my company, but it's not really working right now. And she's mm. like, oh, well, maybe you should talk to my partner, who's a partner at your venture fund. And they're actually looking for a, for, um, a person that... Sounds like they might be kind of like you. It's a director of a portfolio job. They need somebody who can help advise a, a portfolio of companies. I was like, that sounds fun. So as my company was kind of cratering, this this whole new opportunity just showed up out of nowhere. Nice. That's awesome. I'm going to take a guess. I uh, hear an accent there. I'm going to take a guess. Are you Aussie? I'm not. So I'm Dutch. I grew up You're in Dutch. Norway. Okay. And, okay. and I spent like 15 years in the UK, but I've been here for 10 years. So I'm like... I'm just international mutt at this point. Oh, nice. When was the last time you were back in Norway? Oh, it's been a hot minute, actually. Uh, I'm going back uh, for Oslo Innovation Week in a couple of uh, couple of months, so that'll be fun. But um, oh. yeah, I haven't been back in a little while. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so now, obviously, in the advisory role that you mentioned earlier, what are you still doing that currently? No. So these days, I'm a pitch coach. Um, so okay. I'm helping startups raise money from VCs. Um, I wrote a book about it. Uh, it's up there behind me. It's an audio podcast. You can't see this, but there's a book behind me <laughs> called Pitch Perfect. And um, yeah, it's all about how to how to raise money from venture capital. Interesting, interesting. So, like, uh, what's uh, what's the key thing? Let's say I come into your business, right? What are what are the key when you're coaching a, a business to go to a VC, right? What are the key things mm -hmm. that you're looking for to say, okay, this business, you're actually ready? Yeah. So there's actually a whole bunch of things that can happen when. Um, when you're raising venture, right? The, the key thing is to understand how venture works in the first place and, and where the people who are investing find their money. So the way it works out is to actually understand. So a venture firm, a VC firm is run by GPs, general partners. They're the people who actually deploy the cash. They're, they have the fiduciary responsibility and they manage the cash, but they didn't, didn't just they didn't just print the money, right? They had to go and raise it themselves. So they mm. work with limited partners who invest in that venture fund. And so in order to understand as a startup what you're trying to do 
and how you raise money is that you have to show a very clear opportunity that the million dollars they invest in you at some point somehow should possibly turn into $20 million, right? That means that they could potentially return the fund with the investment they put in you. Now, if that isn't even a possibility, if your plans show, hey, uh, here, thank you for your investment, I might be able to get you $3 million back, it means that there isn't, like you're not venture scale. And that's one of the big fundamental challenges that I sometimes find uh, clients that just don't have the uh, a big enough vision for their company. And if there's no opportunity to exit at a big enough valuation, then honestly, it doesn't make sense for venture capital. So it doesn't matter how good the rest of your company is. It doesn't matter how good your team is, but it has to, like, if the opportunity isn't big enough, you're not going to raise money. Okay. Okay. So what, what are the businesses that venture capitalists don't touch? Let's say I, I'm, you know, I'm a baker, you know, do I, right. do I go to a VC and be like, Hey, I need a uh, 200 grand here to, uh, to start this bakery. So venture tends to be specifically for ventures, right? High risk, high reward, high possibility kind of thing. Now I do actually know a, a bakery that has, or a, a, a baking company that has raised venture funding. It's called Wild, Wild Grain. And they, uh, what they do is they, they're, they're a couple of Europeans who came from Europe, came here and was like, wait a minute, the bread here is terrible. That seems completely unnecessary. And so they started baking and they started like, okay, it's possible to make, make part baked bread with premium ingredients. So they put it in like a, a box with some, some dry ice and ship it to you, you put it in your freezer. And when the time is to bake it, you bake it the rest of the way. So you actually bake the mm -hmm. loaf for 20 minutes. That means you get fresh baked bread without really having to know how to bake, without having to do anything. So to answer your question, as a baker, if you are a one person baker who has a little bakery in the corner and you know, you get maybe 50% gross margins, but the scale of what you're doing is limited, you're probably not going to raise venture capital. If you can sign up 50,000 customers for your bakery who every month want a box of baked goods delivered to your door, sure, there's a venture scale opportunity there. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to, I want to, I want to play devil's advocate here. And, and it, can you walk me yeah. through the thinking process of a VC? You know, a VC is coming in there, right? Okay. I'm, I'm, there's a business, right? There's a business being, being pitched to them. What are the, those things you're looking for per se in the sense as to, you know, you mentioned if it's just a one person, now they're very skeptical of a single founder, right? Mm -hmm. So what are those key things in which that as a VC, you're looking at it and you're analyzing them in a business? Mm hmm. So, for me, there's a few things. Actually, I have a whole checklist. Let me just pull that up, and then I can uh, talk you through it properly. If you want to share your screen, feel um, free to do that. Yeah, so I can't actually because this is a customer <laughs> a customer document. Um, but, oh, gotcha. Okay. So basically, the the few. So yeah, I uh, for each of my customers, I have like a whole um, grid of like twenty things that I look at: high priority, medium priority, etc. The big things that will like the that I as an investor would look at is is the team like really really good. Do you have mm. founder market fit? So if you say, hey, I'm going to start a bakery, I'm like, cool, that sounds fun. Tell me about you. And you go like, well, I have an MBA and you know, I uh, have worked as a bar back for many years. And then I worked at a venture capital fund for a bit. I'm like, okay, that's all great. You sound very smart, but where's the baking experience? Because if you were going to start a company in a space, you're up against a world of people who have intense amounts of qualifications, experience, content network, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's an important one. So do you have the founder market fit? Is there something about you as a founding team that is unique and special and incredible? If the, if the answer is no, it's still possible to raise money in some cases, but you have to make up for it somehow. That's the next thing. So I'm looking at traction, like what have you done so far and how do you measure it? For your bakery, traction would be revenue, right? How many breads are you selling every day? How many? How much revenue are you pulling in? How does that look in terms of your cost basis? Are you profitable? All those things show up as traction. If you have both of those things, so you have a good team, you have excellent traction. The third thing I'd be looking at is the market. Is the market big enough to sustain a potentially multi-billion dollar business? If you're a corner yeah. bakery, that bakery has an upper limit of how good it can get, right? And then you have yeah. to turn it into a chain and then you have a lot of operating expense and it gets very hard. It's, it's, it becomes very hard to turn that into a multi-billion dollar business. If you say, I'm opening a coffee shop, I'll be like, dude, you're not going to raise venture funding. And if you turn out to be Starbucks, I'm like, okay, I was wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, but Starbucks yeah. came at this from a different angle. Starbucks happened when most of the coffee out there was mediocre at best. And they were like, you know what? We're going to make slightly better coffee. It's not amazing coffee, 
but it's good. It's good enough. And we're going to open up 3,000 stores. Now suddenly you have a business that's venture scale, right? So thinking about the market that way is, is a really important part of the puzzle. The final two big things I look at as an investor is uh, the ask and use of funds. So how much are you raising and what are you going to spend the money on? Mm. If you are raising, like if you have no traction or anything, you're raising $20 million, I'd be like, ah, explain to me why you need that much. Explain to me why you can't raise $3 million and then solve something that gets you ready for a $20 million round. It's usually a step approach or a, or a milestone approach. And then... Okay. The, the use of funds would be like, okay, you're raising $3 million. That's great. When you spend those $3 million, what are you going to do? And at the end of that, are you ready to raise your next round? Again, if the answer is no, then that means as a founder, you've made some mistakes here. And that would be really challenging. And the final piece I look at is the problem. Like, is the problem fundamentally worth solving? There are problems out there where I'd be like, look, I get that this is useful. Like, if you have a dog and you want to click an app and a dog walker turns up and takes the dog out for a walk, great. All of that sounds very convenient. but I'm not sure that's a problem really worth solving. Interesting. Okay, so now how much I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Let's use a dog. Yeah, thing, right. Please. Is let's say you know you're like okay, I don't see the market here. I don't see it. But then again, there's a few factors that come into play as far as like okay, do you have a dog? Right. <clears throat> if you have your dog yourself, you're like okay, do I you know what the convenience? Because I, I personally think, especially for most founders, are they 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 start up trying to solve a problem that they've experienced, right? Mm -hmm. And most venture capitalists are coming from a perspective of a different hat where they've never experienced that problem. So, so could right. it be in a sense as to saying, okay, I don't see this as, an, as, a, as a problem worth solving, worth solving. Could it be from a perspective of that VC is like, has not experienced that problem at all? 100%. Uh, and the history of VC is full of people who fall exactly into that bucket. I don't know if you know this story, but Airbnb got turned down 800 times before they raised mm -hmm. money. And now it's a fantastically popular comp a company, right? Mm -hmm. But it means that they sat across, I don't know if the number is 800, it was just hundreds, many, many times. But the thing is, they sat across from investors, very, very smart people with lots of experience and lots of money who said, nah, nobody's going to want to stay in somebody's house and pay money, right? Or nah, nobody's going to rent out their spare room or nah, right? People just didn't see, like didn't understand that that was a world that could be possible. And that happens all the time. So by all means, it's very possible I might be wrong about dog walking apps. Like maybe there is a possibility. But my personal bugbear there is that like as an investor, I I hold some power, right? I have, I, I get to vote with my dollars for the products I want to see out in the world. And if you come to me and you say, look, I'm a really good developer. I'm very smart. I have a lot of experience here and I'm going to spend all of my smarts and resources and attention and love and pour that into a dog walking app. I'd be like, Emmanuel, seriously, can you think of nothing better to do with your life? Yeah. <laughs> and that's my super personal bias. Right. But there are yeah. like there's there's like there's any number of problems, climate change, unemployment, like there's there's many, many big societal problems that I think are worth solving. And my fear is that a lot of the kind of slightly more frivolous products and companies, you can make money there, but is that really where you're going to like is that is that where you going to put your attention? And a lot of the time I those types I see a lot of those types of opportunities and I'm like I see you. Maybe you can turn this into a few million dollars, right? Maybe you can make a decent buck. And this is not where I like I, I have limited time. And if I make an investment, I also spend time with the, the people I invest in if they want that. And I'm like, I don't want to spend my time on this. It might be a good opportunity, but this isn't worth my life force, basically. So basically, there's a lot of uh, personality from the VC that actually goes into the investment, you know, the investment they pick, right? Because you, from what you said is you actually, since you're investing your time, um, you want to kind of invest your time in something that you will be enjoying actually being a pro part of the process. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to draw a slight difference here. So I'm not a VC. Okay. I'm an angel investor, right? And angels are slight, slightly different from VCs. I invest my own money and okay. I have my own kind of decision. VCs are institutionals who've raised money from other people, or there might be a family office. So they like, if I had like multi-billion dollars, I could set up a VC that only invests my money. That's a thing that exists. But realistically, 
an in institutional professional investor is a lot more sophisticated around these types of questions, right? If somebody comes to them with the equivalent of a dog walking app, they'll be like, okay, tell me about the market. Tell me about the comp competitors. Mm -hmm. Tell me about like, how is this a good idea? And so that might be slightly different from, from their point of view. Gotcha. Now, have you, have you ever made a bad investment? Of course. I think the vast majority of my investments didn't work out. Um, <laughs> And that's the truth there is that because I'm an angel investor, right? I don't have that much money to invest. But the truth is uh, what happens often is that you invest at a very, very early stage where companies mm -hmm. are still trying to figure their shit out. Sorry, can I swear? Where they're still trying Absolutely. to figure it's their easy. stuff yeah, out. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm <laughs> yeah, a bit of a bit of bit of a sailor. Uh, but <laughs> they have to figure they have to figure their shit out, right? And so in that stage, things very often go wrong. Like you have a set of assumptions and as a startup, what you're trying to do is to prove or disprove those assumptions. Now, if it turns out that there's a fundamental assumption you got wrong, well, then the company doesn't really have a reason to exist. And sometimes you have to spend some money to figure that out, right? You build a, an MVP, a minimum viable product, you put it out into the market and it turns out the customers don't really want it. Like, hmm. so for example, the dog walking app example, right? I don't want to rag on dog walking apps. If you're listening and you're building a dog walking app, best of luck to you. But... <laughs> If you're building a dog walking app and you say, okay, uh, all my neighbors say they want this, uh, you know, we can do this for, uh, like we can, we can find the dog walkers, we can match them, we can do the scheduling, we can do all this kind of thing. And when the rubber hits the road and you're sitting there with the app and going, it's going to cost me 30 bucks for somebody to walk my dog. I'm just going to walk my dog myself. Right. Mm. Some people have the money and are willing to do it. Some people do it sometimes, but this is where you kind of get into the proof phase. And the question becomes, as a founder, are you able to find the market that is willing to spend the money to buy your product? That is different from your neighbor saying, oh, I would totally use this. Because by the time they have to dig out their credit card, right, people have different behaviors. They, what people say they will do and what they actually do is often pretty different. So that's the difference between theoretical economics and applied economics. And applied economics gets really interesting. There's an old joke that is like two economists walks walk past a, a lottery shop and both buy and buy, go in and buy a lottery ticket. The joke is that there's no way it makes any financial sense to buy a lottery ticket, but people do it anyway, even if you know yeah. that you're doing something silly. So the measured behavior and in the, in the context of, of startups, that is your KPIs, your key performance indicators are, can be pretty variable. Interesting. No, no. So let, let's look at it from a perspective of a you evaluation, right? Let's say, uh, uh, you know, as an in, angel investor, right? You invested in a business. Yep. Let's say you put a hundred grand in, okay? And, mm -hmm. you know, you work on an equity split, right? Let's say you take 20% or 30%, right? Now, when let's say they need to go for another round of funding, and now they're actually going up, you know, to VCs for the next round of funding, because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe now they're, it's a 10 to $15 million valuation, which by the way, is a valuation, is that a eight year multiple? What's the, what's the valuation being based off of? So, um, if any company comes to an angel investor and sells 20% of their company for a hundred thousand dollars, they need to have some serious talks with themselves. That is a terrible valuation. That should never happen. Just to make a quick note of that. But having said that, um, the valuations for startups is a bit of a dark, dark art, right? Because a lot of them don't have revenue by the time they're raising money. And so it doesn't mm. really make sense to talk about multiples. Uh, multiples is uh, more commonly used for uh, what they call operating concerns. So those are businesses that are a Starbucks, for example, right? You have Starbucks. Mm -hmm. they, they're a publicly listed company, so they do quarterly re uh, reporting. And so you can see, okay, this quarter they made this and this much money. Uh, and the stock price is this and this, or the market cap is this and this. And so you know what their multiple is. For startups, that's really hard because a lot of the time, startups are kind of selling you on the dream. They can say, okay, I'm a founder. I have a PhD in this. I have worked on this for 15 years. I've been at three companies that do this particular type of pharma. I have a patent. So I'm a uniquely well-positioned person to start this company. Now I'm going to raise money to solve a particular type of cancer. Right. Mm. And I have a, some sort of solution in mind. Now, if you invest at that stage, I don't have a product. I don't have FDA um, approval. Right. There's nothing. There's literally nothing there. There's nothing to multiply. And so it's very hard to do the um, do the math on what the actual valuation is. And so the way it typically works is like the investors kind of come together and go, OK, what do we think this company could be worth in the future? 
And ultimately with companies, right, it's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. So if you're a, if I say, okay, I will invest in your company at a $5 million valuation and somebody else comes along as I will invest in your company at a $20 million valuation, you can take my money if you want to, but you'd be very silly. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's, it's a very, uh, inexact science. Okay. Okay. So then that brings me to this question as to, let's say they go for another round of funding and you have, let's say you had that one person that yeah. really didn't do the due diligence and, you know, they did do a hundred grand for 20%, right? Um, now, when they go for the next round of funding, how does it work per se with it? Is it, are they giving up more of their equity or is your equity also on the line as well? Right. Your so share. Um, the Good question. Very good question. So if I own 20% of a company and you're the founders, you own 80% of the company, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a new round, it's typically dilutive. So what happens is that you, uh, I own 20 shares, you own 80 shares. What you do is you issue another 100 shares. Now suddenly I own 10% uh, of the company, you mm -hmm. own 40% of the company, and the rest is for whatever the new investor is. So it means that you get diluted, I get diluted, but we get diluted at the same rate. So you just mm. issue more shares, basically, and you sell those. And in the process, the, the theory is like, oh, no, like you could say, wait, then I own less than 20% of the company. That is true. But the value of the company also goes up. So the theory is it's better to own uh, you know, 10% of a multi-million dollar company than it is to own 20% of a of a one million dollar company. Interesting, interesting. Okay, now it's it's very fascinating to me the 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 VC world. Now, obviously, with the introduction of ChatGPT, right, which is the, in the tech space, which is I think it's changed in things. Have you seen mm -hmm. any new come ups in AI in in new found new businesses basically being founded off of an AI platform? Oh yeah, tons. Uh, AI is one of the hottest. Um, bits of VC right now. Um, actually, actually, I had two pitch coaching clients who both signed up for um, pitch coaching. And by the time they turned up to the first uh, session, they were like, uh, I have a term sheet. Now, term sheet is what an investor gives you. It's like, hey, these are the, this is what I'm hoping to invest. And if you both agree, then they do a lot of legal work and wire the money, basically. So they, he had already done, they, they both already done the work. And it's like, well, sounds like you don't need me, <laughs> right? You've, you've, got your term sheet, that means the work is done. So AI, there's a ton of stuff happening in terms of product development, in terms of product design, in terms of um, uh, voice recognition, uh, generative mm -hmm. AI is huge, right? You can go on a, a number of stock sites now and search just by generative AI. Um, mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of copywriting is basically dead now, right? If you can get an AI to write a hundred word uh, product description, based on a website, then why would you get somebody to write it by hand? So lots of things like that are now massively getting disrupted. And um, yeah, they're evolving in various ways. One of the companies I worked with was raising money to do uh, AI-based uh, product formulations. So imagine, uh, imagine you have a shampoo, right? Or you're a shampoo manufacturer. And there's, uh, there's been a supply chain crisis. And you're like, there's this one ingredient I can't get anymore. But people still want this shampoo. It might be some obscure mineral or whatever. Yeah. Now you have to reformulate. You can't just take the mineral out and call it a day. You have to replace it with something because otherwise the whole formulation shifts. Maybe it isn't shelf stable. Maybe the color changes. Uh -huh. Maybe whatever. People still want essentially the same product with the same functionality, but you have to change something. So this company is using AI to analyze all the different types of shampoos out there and saying, okay, if you take this ingredient out, you can replace it with these two or this, or you can do this formulation change. And they're actually working with company like very, very, actually, I can't tell you which ones they're working with, but companies you've definitely know of, they, they work with, and you know, they're shaving five years of a uh, product development cycle. And so when companies like that come along and are able to use the power of AI, to have huge outsized uh, savings and speed advantages, you better believe there's going to be a lot of investment in AI. Okay, so now uh, this brings me to the uh, the dot com bubble, right? It happened in the early '90s, right, where you know the internet <clears throat> was fresh in the market and everybody was so excited, and then boom, it all crashed, right? And yeah. um, the last guest I had on was also he was a, a, a stock investor and, and his, his, he was a wealth management fund guy, and he was out of Canada. 
And he uh, he had mentioned a reason, a lot of reasons why the dot com bubble happened was not because it was a problem with the internet at the time. It was a problem with the market not being ready. <laughs> right. So, how much of this? Because you know what's interesting is there's a lot of people I interact with, and I'm like, hey, do you use ChatGPT? And they're like, what's ChatGPT? What 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 is ChatGPT? Yeah, no. So I use it all the time. Yeah, everyone, which almost any business owner can, because now you, it 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 can literally condense. You know, in in our business, what would take us usually about maybe two to three weeks or forty hours of work per staff can be condensed in thirty minutes, right? Because AI could just you know write the copy for you. Now, how much of it do you think you know there might be an AI bubble, like an AI dot com bubble, because the market might not be ready for it? Um. <clears throat> That's a complicated question to answer because I think because I think the market dynamics are pretty different now from the first dot com bubble. Now, okay. this there's an interesting evolution. Do you want to nerd out about this for a moment? Absolutely. Yeah, cool. I love nerding out about this. So, yeah, yeah. Um, the dot com bubble happened at a time when it was actually very hard to, to develop software, and a lot of the methodologies we are using today didn't really exist. Like people didn't have the web development frameworks and platforms to develop quickly. So that meant that every everything you wanted to do, you had to develop some, from scratch. There was no such thing as a content management platform. Like if you use Squarespace now, you don't know how good you have it. Um, if you use Shopify, like Shopify in itself is genius, right? Before Shopify, like imagine you had to build a, a web store and you have to figure out Payment mm -hmm. processing, you have to figure out address uh, validation, you have to figure out inventory management, you have to figure out mm. the design, you have to figure out the pictures, they have to be um, dynamically resized, right? Shopify does so many things out of the box that I've actually had to develop in one of my previous roles before. And it is insane. It is insane how much time that takes. So in, in that dot-com bubble, what ended up happening like a famous one is uh, pets.com. Another famous one was the, um, was the web van. Web van was a grocery store, essentially, that was uh, raised tons and tons of money. And before they even made a single sale, they had to build an entire ecosystem and infrastructure. So they had to go and they had to go to the shop and buy literal servers. They had to install them in a rack. They had to put internet in this server room. They had to develop all the software completely from scratch because there was nothing to base it on. And then they had to go and build out an entire cold warehouse. They spent a god awful amount of money putting in like full on warehousing systems with with automation and robots and all that kind of stuff. They spent millions and millions and millions of dollars, filled the warehouse with avocados and bananas and rice and God knows what. And then they were like, okay, now we're ready. People can buy groceries online. And the six people who had internet were like, nah, I'm good actually. I'll just go to Safeway. Now, yeah. right, that's essentially what happened in dot-com bubble. Like people had to spend so much money developing all these products and services and having the warehouse and having the stock and all that kind of stuff. And then they realized there weren't enough customers because the people who did have internet were like, eh, I don't really trust the internet. I don't want to buy on the internet or certainly not on the regular. Mm. Today, if you want to develop something like that, things are super, super different. You can stand up a web shop in 20 minutes by using Shopify. You can send text messages to people in 10 minutes using Twilio. You can set up a virtual shop like the way I would do it now to figure out if web van was a good idea, you grab Shopify, you put it online, you put some inventory in, somebody buys something, I go to Safeway, I bring it to them. I don't have to build a whole warehouse. I can just sure. like, it's called a concierge MVP. It's like, will people do this? So that has massively yeah. shifted. The other thing that now exists is AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. That mm -hmm. means that you don't have to buy your own servers, right? You can le rent space on their servers and they take care of the maintenance, backups, all that kind of stuff. That used to be six people's jobs in the old days. Yeah. And so all these efficiencies are happening all at the same time, which means that running a startup now means that you can actually just plug a whole bunch of stuff together. Like you're not going to develop your own payment processing. You're, you'll use Square or Stripe or PayPal or God knows what, or Amazon Pay, right? These are all solutions. That means you don't have to have the incredible nightmare of dealing with credit cards. And so taking all these components and putting them together, now if you were to build a dog walking app, <laughs> the only thing you have to do is to actually build the front end. Like the... The user creation, you can grab off the shelf. The payment processing, you can grab off the shelf. A lot of the design stuff, you can grab off the shelf. You need your brand. 
you need the logic that connects it all together, and maybe you need customer support. But building something like that today is so much faster than before, and that massively de-risks it, right? You can build Webvan with probably $50,000. You don't have to spend $50 million. And that shift has been very interesting from a VC point of view, because it means that if I'm investing in something, I can say, hey, like, what is the smallest amount of work you can do to prove or disprove what you're trying to do? Like build an MVP. Let prove to me that people want this. Prove to me that you can find your customers at a reasonable cost and prove to me that they're willing to spend money on what you're selling. So that's all shifted. And so I think with AI, we're starting to see the same thing. People are very clearly seeing benefits in AI already. And so they're willing to use it for that reason. Hmm. Interesting. So how much of everything you just said as far as the ease of creation now means that there's ease of competition? Oh, absolutely. This is why I'm saying the the founder market fit is more and more important. Like Mm. if you have a PhD in something, if you have, like if you were the VP of product at Nike for 20 years, I'm like, okay, you know everything there is to know about uh, about sports goods. And if you come to me and say, hey, Haya, I'm about to start this new company that's all about sporting goods. Uh, and I've, I know everybody in the business. I've been to every trade show. I know every supplier. I've spent most of my life in Vietnam and Thailand and, and, and Bangladesh and other places where they make clothes. I know everything about this business and I've spotted an opportunity. The opportunity is X, Y, Z. Maybe it's vegan clothing. Maybe it's whatever it is, right? So you're saying, I take all of this knowledge I have and I put it towards this very specific use case. I think I can build a business here. That is where it gets interesting for me because anybody can set up a a fashion brand. It's not hard at all, right? You, we, the two of us can start a fashion. Well, I can't look at how I'm dressed, but two of us (laughs) could start a fashion brand today if we wanted to. We come up with a cool name, we come up with a website, we start selling, right? But not neither of us. Well, I don't know about you, but I definitely know nothing about fashion or the industry, so I don't have a competitive edge there. And so when you when you ask about competition. Yes, it's much easier and quicker to build products. Building tech is much easier and quicker. So now the question becomes, where's the competitive edge that you and me have to build this company? And I think a lot more of the conversation is happening around what's the team, what's the traction, how big is the market, and what is the problem you're really solving? Okay. Okay. So so basically, it's there is competition. But what makes it unique is like, uh, obviously, you've read the book, The Blue Ocean Strategy, right? Yep. It's, it's kind of like what makes you, gives you that competitive edge to basically go in a different market where it's almost like you don't have any competition because you're just you're doing something completely different and, and it's going to be very tough right now to catch up with you. That's interesting. Now, you know, um, and, and I know you also, let's just kind of like uh, uh, talk a little bit about more of the podcast that you have here. You co-host the uh, HAI. Right. Can you talk a little bit about yes. the, the code, what you do there? Yeah, I do two podcasts. One is my own one. I turned 40 a while ago, and uh, I had kind of a fantastic midlife crisis of not really knowing what, I, what the hell I was doing oh, do, with do my tell, life. Do tell, do tell. How would you realize yeah. it? <laughs> um, well, I was freshly divorced, and there was a pandemic. And I was like, mm. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I don't know how to make choices in my life. I don't, you know. I was depressed. I was sad. I was confused. Everything kind of sucked. And so I started a podcast about the meaning of life. I was like, I'm curious what happens if I have these really big conversations with some of my best friends. And mm-hmm. my my goal was to record 40 episodes in my 40th year. Of course, I didn't get mm-hmm. there at all. I did something like 12, 13. But yeah, that was a really interesting journey of like, even with some very close friends, I'd never really talked about the the meaning of life. And I was really surprised. Some of my smartest friends were like, eh, I don't really have an opinion. I was like, really? And some people um, that are kind of more spiritual also didn't have an idea about the meaning of life. And I was like, this is so fascinating. And then a bunch of others had like really deep, insightful, beautiful conversations about why are we here? What happens after you die? All the big philosophical things. So that's one podcast that I, I love doing. And it might be fun to have you on that one, actually, to uh, to talk about the meaning of life. No, I, I, which, the, which is very interesting is I wanted, and I actually was actually going about to ask you the question, what what had been your conclusion so far in the recovery of you on the conclusion of life, on the meaning of life? Um, the cop-out answer is that I still don't know. Interesting. But I think the um, one of the big goals in life is to be happy. 
And happiness to me is the ability to enjoy the now. And so if you've designed yourself a life where you're not able to be happy in this moment, like ever, mm -hmm. it's a sign that something needs to change. Like so that doesn't might... mean that everything is going great all the time, right? Shit goes uh -huh. sideways nonstop, right? Like, that's just being alive. You sometimes some idiot crashes into your car because that's life. But if at the end of that day, you're able to say, you know what? In this moment, I'm able to be grateful and able to be happy. I think that is, I think it isn't actually the meaning of life, but it is like a, a proxy for that, for me anyway. Interesting. So I want to, I want to kind of use an analogy because for the longest, I thought, you know, happiness was the meaning of life. And then I realized, mm -hmm. uh, have you watched the movie, The Matrix with Keanu? Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. I think there was a scene there and he said where he, they were talking about how um, they basically created initially the first creation was about giving the human mind a utopia and basically mm -hmm. what ended up happening was the human mind rejected it right so they had to give it problems right and i've kind of kind of realized as to war comes from peace mm -hmm. right war comes from peace mm -hmm. right and human beings we crave variety Right. And almost like we need challenges to create excitement. Right. There's a reason why people go skydiving. There's a reason why people go bungee jumping. Right. I mean, those right. are most of those things can kill you, but you still go do it. And I, I kind of came to like the, the conclusion that um, I don't know, which is weird is I don't think happiness is I think happiness is very subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I personally think that if to me, the, the meaning of life is is genuinely which is which is which is kind of weird but it's to not be forgotten mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna explain legacy. that I'm gonna, uh, yeah a legacy right but the only way that you can create a legacy is by creating an impact mm -hmm. right and it's almost as though i think life is a test right and all those who end up not getting forgotten are those who, who strive to for more right I don't, I don't, yep. I, I, that's, that, that's, I don't know. It's a weird, it's a weird, because like I was having a conversation with my girlfriend and uh, we were at a museum last night and there was this big posters of just, you know, famous people and stuff. And I looked at it and I said, and I thought, and I told them, and I was like, everything that I'm doing will be forgotten. Right. But my goal mm -hmm. is to not be forgotten in the first two generations. Which is weird. I, I don't know. That was it. That was my whole thing. Because at the end of the day, like, like I don't know about you, but like, for instance, when my father died, everything he worked for just went. It's gone. He didn't mm -hmm. take it with him, mm -hmm. right? But his yeah. man, his name still lives on. I don't know. That's that, that. That's kind of the whole. I don't know. That's my perspective. You know. I it's, think you're onto something. I think leaving a legacy is something that a lot of people think about, right? It's like, is it through your work? Is it through your art? Is it mm -hmm. through? your contribution to history? Is it through your children? Like lots of people have different ways of, of leaving a legacy. Um, and if you think about history, if you think about the big news stories, people don't always leave legacies for good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. If you go and shoot up a church, people will remember you, but also fuck you very much, right? There are reasons <laughs> that people are, there are reasons people are remembered. And I think legacy is a really interesting one there. Like if you just want to be remembered, you can do something really stupid and definitely be remembered. And I think there's a layer on top of that, which is like, okay, what do you want to be remembered for? And mm -hmm. to me, it is like, what is the good that you put forward in the world? I think that mm -hmm. is very important. And actually one of the more interesting things of being, being a human being and being alive uh, is like, what are the things that you are like, why, why are you not? What are you kind of thing? Yeah. So, okay, so now, which also kind of brings me to a point as to, you know, and I'm just going to use this example, if you don't mind, where you turn 40 and you run into, you got into the midlife crisis. And I think midlife crisis comes from when you look back in your life and you look at what you've accomplished and you look forward in your life and you see what is the meaning behind everything I've done so far. And if I keep doing it, is it going to have any meaning in the future? Is, 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 is that more, more or less, am I right on point there or, or close? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So, so which means that a lot of the work you you you, you do now post forty has to be work that gives you meaning. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that would be good. I think what is happening for me is that I. I don't think I'm currently on track. 
Like, I don't think I'm on track towards my meaning of life. Uh, and I found some peace there. I think what I decided to do is like, okay, what if I'm just curious? What if I follow my curiosity? Uh, I love being a pitch coach. I love spending so much time working with founders and drawing stories out of them. And like when, when they go and pitch to uh, like at a pitch competition or they go and pitch to a VC and they come back, I'm like, oh my God, they love my pitch. I'm like, yes, so proud of you. That's awesome. We did that together. That feels good. And like, is that ultimately what I want to be remembered for? I don't know. For now, this is a really beautiful way to make a living. It's interesting. It's fun. It's inspiring. Mm. And, you know, I'm like, I'm choosing not to have children. And so that's not mm -hmm. one way th to my legacy. I've written a whole bunch of books, but I don't think I'm going to be remembered for those. Um, so I'm just, I, and I don't actually mind legacy all that much. I don't think it's something that's particularly important to me. Um, but it is like that is something that has definitely come up in a number of the interviews I did about the meaning of life that people are like, oh, I want to be remembered or I want to leave the world better than I found it or any number of different ways of looking at that. Mm. So what does what does on track? What does that look like for you? It's mm, a really good question. My therapist asks me this all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> very astute. No, I don't actually know. I think. Um, like if I, so I don't know if this is true for you, but I feel like people who have their act together have some sort of a North star. Mm -hmm. Like they know where they're going. They may not always be going straight towards it, but they're meandering their way towards some sort of North star, right? If they're yeah. given a choice between two, like a life choice between two pretty big, important things, they look at it and go, well, this one gets me closer to my North star faster. So I'm going to choose this mm -hmm. thing. I feel like I don't have that. I feel like I'm meandering a lot in life. My career is very interesting, but it isn't really a career, right? I've had like six careers. And so I'm, I'm thinking about it that way. Of like, I don't, I don't really have a good answer for you. This is something that's very kind of raw and in the moment for, <laughs> for me trying to you figure know, it out. So what's interesting is, have you had anything chaotic happen? to you, like a chaos in your life, something that created confusion. I mean, I mentioned the divorce. Um, mm -hmm. When you get married, you don't really plan for a divorce, right? And so that was actually a huge, that was a huge thing. I think that was a huge starter of chaos. And I think mm -hmm. at some point I came to the conclusion that, hey, there's a lot of things that is beautiful about this relationship, but there's something that like there was like an irreconcilable difference. Um, and at that point I was like, okay, so I know not that, but then what, like, what do I want from my relationships, from my communities, from my life? Um, mm -hmm. And I don't fully know if I'm, be if I'm being perfectly honest. Interesting. You know, the reason why I asked that is so, um, back in 2011, my father had his first cancer episode, right? And that was the first time ever that I thought about losing my father, right? Never, ever, you know, up until then, no one ever thinks about their parents dying, right? And I remember looking at him and, and watching just him in the hospital. And to this day, it is the most, I can't, it, it, I, I don't, it's not something I talk about much, but after that moment, I sat down and I asked myself, I said, what would happen if he died? Right. And my mom has had a stroke since I was two. So she was, you know, she was nowhere to take care of the family. The business relied heavily on him. So if he passed away, he was going to, you know, that was going to be it. So I set up a three year plan to make more money than he did. Okay. And I was 18 at the time or 17 at the time, <laughs> which was funny. Um, and I didn't in three years make more money than he did. But in nine years, I did. Right. But it set me up on a path where I had one single, uh, single mission, which was to provide for my mother. Right. And in a way, I think responsibility for me is my is like my North Star. That was the first time that I ever became truly awake because then I realized that there was someone who will genuinely need me at some point. And that's why I kind of go to the point of like legacy is, you know, People say you're selfless when they give, but in reality, when you give, you feel better about yourself. 
you feel better, right? So in a way, a selfless act is actually selfish because are you really doing it for that person or are you doing it because it makes you feel good, right? So in a sense of, in, in a way, I kind of look at it as the North Star is because you said something like, I don't know what my North Star is. And honestly, I generally don't either. But I don't think anyone does. But I think we do everything we do in life for somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. It's kind of getting a little. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a deep and interesting strand in moral philosophy around, is there such thing as a selfless act? Why do we ever do anything? Right. Yeah. If, even if you spend your entire universe volunteering, are you doing it for the credit? Are you doing it to atone for something? Right. There's a whole lot of really interesting uh, theories around that. And, you know, I can nerd out about this for hours as well, but, um, my question is, does it really matter? Like if you, there's this, there was this meme that was going around for a while when um, Trump took us out of the uh, Paris Accord and mm -hmm. people were saying, oh no, we, we do all this stuff uh, to, to help the planet. What if we accidentally just make the world better and it didn't help the planet? Like, well, great. Accidentally making the world better sounds fantastic. And I think there's yeah. a, there's an interesting thing to think about there. Like sometimes it doesn't matter why you do something like you, you're walking around on the street, you're, you're holding a candy wrapper and there's a bin like 10 minute walk away. You're walking past it anyway. Are you going to hold it for 10 minutes or do you drop it? Like, it doesn't matter if you want to be good to the environment or if you're worried somebody sees you or whatever, if you choose to hold on to that candy wrapper and drop it in the bin, great mission accomplished. Doesn't matter why. And so figuring out like, uh, for some people, it might be God can see me. For some people, it might be what if police sees me and I get ticketed. For some people, it's like, I am a good person and that's why I want to do it or whatever the reason. It doesn't matter. And I think there's an interesting piece around, like I, I to, back to my point about the North Star, I think I'm doing a fair amount of good in the world, but I don't necessarily know the why. Like there's no clear mm. reason for me for doing good. And that's, that actually troubles me a little bit. I don't, I like the sense I have that other people have a much clearer picture of the why. And I, I, I have a little sense of longing there, a little bit of missing that. So if, if everything you're doing right now, someone came to you and said, hi, I'm going to give you a million bucks to not show up to work tomorrow. Would you take it? I mean, I would love to know why, but a million bucks to not show up to work tomorrow sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'd be like, okay, why are you doing this? What do you got out of this? Right? There's well, a, there's a. Well, the the, <laughs> the 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 most interesting thing about it is is someone once asked me the question of, can your dreams be bought? Right? In the sense as to, mm. it was like, if I gave you enough money to not work tomorrow. And I gave you the woman of your dreams. Would you still show up to work tomorrow? And I had to think about I that. Think, I was like, the world. Yeah. No, I, well, I that's, think for that's me, the it kind of boils down to why Why do you work? Right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole, if you win the lottery, would you still keep working? Um, I think I would almost certainly shift how I work and who I work with and what I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the larger picture, like helping founders build companies that matter. I think I will continue to do that, but I might choose to work like right now I have to also pay my rent. Mm. I might choose to work with uh, a set of founders who can't afford what I do, or I might choose to um, work with different geographies, or I might choose to like, there's any number of ways that I could shift what I did if money was no object. I mean, I would also mm -hmm. probably take a couple of months worth of holiday because God knows I need one, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the, the key thing and the reason why I asked that is if if money was not, a, and, and that was also the reason why I paraphrase and we asked the question to you is if money was not a question in your day-to-day -day endeavors is what you choose to do will be based off of your why. You know, because so, like, for instance, you know, um, so people have asked me, why do you do the podcast? I'm like, I do it generally because I just love talking to other business owners because it is being an entrepreneur is the most loneliest thing I've ever, because it's when you're talking and 99% of people you talk to can't relate to you because they see you as a crazy person, right? Or, you know, you, 
you invest in a business that fails, but then you keep investing in it and they look at you like you're stupid. <laughs> right? And, and then you're like, it's like, uh, how did I, 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 for a while, which was kind of weird. Someone said this. I can't remember what podcast. It says being an entrepreneur is the closest thing to having a mental illness. Because you keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping that the thing will change. Yeah. Which is weird. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. I think as a founder, you have to be able to see a world that you want to live in that is different from the world you live in now. That takes an incredible amount of imagination. And then in addition to that, you have to imagine the path from how to make the world we live in now change towards the, wo the world we want to live in in the future. That's extraordinary. That takes an extraordinary mm -hmm. amount of stubbornness, call it mental illness, sure. Like this, there's, there's, yeah, you have to have a particular type of drive that, frankly, not a lot of people have. I actually, yeah. in my pitch coaching, I actually talk quite a few people out of starting businesses. Mm. Um, Why? Especially if it touches one of the really big, like, challenges. I'm like, hey, sounds to me you might not be the right person to start this company. Because if I do a little mm. bit of research, I can find a whole bunch of companies that are competing with you but where the founding team has much deeper roots in the in the industry you're in and you just can't compete there like how how are you going to beat somebody who has been the vp of product at nike for 20 years right, right. it doesn't matter that you like sneakers this person has been making sneakers for 20 years i hear yeah. that you want to disrupt but you need something to disrupt with like your idea is great but nike has an enormous amount of experience and this person can very easily raise a huge amount of money. Like, what is it about you? Like, and sometimes if people go, oh crap, I didn't realize that's who I'm up against. And some people are so stubborn that they're like, no, I'm going to make it happen anyway. I'm like, good on you. Great. You, you pass the test, keep going. And some people are like, this sounds like it's much harder than I was expecting. It's like, okay, that's, that's fine. Like, think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, is this, as you mentioned, it's lonely. Chances mm -hmm. of success are pretty slim. It's incredible amounts of work. It's pretty thankless, you know, mm -hmm. and it takes a special amount of like, yeah, it takes a special kind of crazy and a special amount of crazy to, to be a founder. No, that's, that's, that's definitely, you, you said it the easiest, the uh, easier. And it's, it's fascinating though. And a lot of people still choose to embark on it because, um, which you were saying that, and I had a conversation with, a. um, an acquaintance of mine, he had a very decent job and he was thinking about, you know, quitting his job and being an entrepreneur because he thought he had a good idea. And I was like, and we had the conversation and I was like, and I asked him, I'm like, are you, you know, are you willing to give up sleep? Are you willing to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and just work? Are you willing to, you know, and then he kind of just thought about it. He was like, I don't think I'm really that passionate about, uh, you know, and I was like, yeah, you sometimes, you know, make enough money what you're doing and then whatever money you have on the side, you can invest with somebody else with a passion. But now, okay, so I'm going to ask you this question, which is very interesting. And this is a personal perspective for me. So I've kind of been a, I've, I've invested in a few other businesses, right? But I'm not like an angel investor where I'm putting like 50 grand, you know, maybe putting like nine, 10 grand into a few businesses. And I saw that the, the founder did not put in as much work or the business owner or whoever it is did not put in as much work because it's not their money. Right. And when people don't have their money in the line, they don't have the skin in the game. They don't feel the, 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 the burn. So how much of that are you, how do you deal with the fact that knowing that this person that you're investing in does not have the financial risk and liability that you do? Um, I have never experienced that. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is that, most of the time, the people that are starting companies, they may not, I mean, they they usually invest some of their own money as well. But more yeah. importantly, they have opportunity costs, right? Like if you are an ex-Facebook engineer and you made an uh, enormous amount of money that way, leaving Facebook to start a company means that the $300,000 paycheck you were collecting goes away. And so in a way... Uh, they may not be putting money in like directly into the company, although they probably are. Um, the opportunity cost is enormous. And so, plus, you know, they are putting usually a lot more than 40 hours a week into this thing. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, sweat equity is a thing. Like if, if I give you, like, and people usually work their asses off. You don't start a company for fun. You start a company because you really want something to exist. 
Like mm. most of the founders I've seen are tenacious. They're incredibly tenacious. Um, and yeah, if you come across somebody who kind of half asses it, then I don't know what to tell you. That's that's in my experience pretty rare. Interesting. No, you said something which is very important is they don't start companies for fun. They start it because they want this to truly exist. And I know, uh, I know we're kind of short on time here. So, you know, um, any, you know, where can people find you if they want to work with you? Yeah. If you want to work with me, they can find me on Haya.me. That's H A J E dot M E. Uh, I'm also Haya on Twitter. I'm super easy to find. Uh, and a bunch of my writings are on TechCrunch. So you can find a bunch of like advice for, uh, fundraising and stuff there. Um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to find me. Okay, perfect. So if you guys have a dog walking business and you know, you're going to be walking dog and you have an app, then you know that the links are going to be in the description to go, you know, uh, uh, message higher there. But it was a great, yeah, it was yeah. great if having you If you ever need on. help for a dog walking app, please don't hesitate to ask somebody else first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure having you on. Any uh, last words, anything else you want to share with the guest? Dude, this was amazing. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you for making an awesome podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right, guys. You guys have a good one. Enjoy.